We now have great honor in presenting to you our brother Ahmad Dirat from the قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإن تتولوا يستبدل قوما غيرهم ثم لا يكون أمثالا صدق الله صدق الله العظيم My dear brethren I read to you the last segment of the last ayah of Surah Muhammad You know that there is a surah in the Quran and the name of the surah is Muhammad Allah Barit Allah has named it in honor of the name of our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Surah Muhammad I don't know whether you know at home how easy or how difficult it is for you to find this if somebody tells you that this is from Surah Muhammad it is I feel a very important duty on our part that when anybody makes any references to the Holy Quran and gives you a reference to go home and check it up. Not that you are doubting the speaker, that the man has some reason to bluff you. No. The very fact that if you take the trouble of checking, checking up these references, you read the ayah with the translation and the commentary, it will help you in understanding what the learned man has already said. And by doing that, that part of knowledge will become your own property. Like this, it's more like an entertainment. You listen to a beautiful lecture, and we go into ecstasy, sometimes we shed tears, and we say, how nice, you know, the Qari bacha the Quran, and how nicely the Imam, you know, delivered his beautiful message. But what was it? It's forgotten very easily. But if we take the trouble of checking up the references, that will become a part of your own property, your own knowledge. And you in turn will be able to share with others. From that point of view, go home and check it out. But how will you find this surah, Muhammad? In our Arabic Quran, very difficult. The one called the Mashhaf, what we have been reading as children from Alif Ba to the end, what we have been reading, we memorize, but we don't know the meaning. And the reference is very difficult for the non-Arab especially to find. <coughs> but if you have a translation like this, this particular one here, as our chairman has introduced by Abdullah Yusuf Ali, this particular one has so many advantages over any other translation, over all translations. This translation is the only translation which gives you an ayah by ayah translation verse by verse the other translations people have taken the shortcut they put one whole page of the Arabic on one side and the English on the other side you don't know which verse refers to what unless you are a scholar you know otherwise you don't know which is which this one here it begins Bismillah rahman rahim Side by side, say, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, say, all praise is due to Allah, the cherisher and sustainer of the world. Side by side, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, most gracious, most merciful, Maliki Yawmiddin, master of the day of judgment. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een, say, thee alone we worship and thee alone we ask for help. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem, guide us on to the straight path. Sirat al lazina and amta alayhim, the path of those on whom thou hast bestowed thy favors. Ghayr al maqbubi alayhim al dalin, not of those who earn thine anger, nor of those who go astray, side by side, verse by verse, translation. Over a period, if you keep on repeating, like 
most of my brethren in the Cape, I find that they know Surah Yasin by heart. Again and again I hear them, Bacha the Yasin Sharif. Almost everybody I come across him to know Surah Yasin. But about the meaning? If you also take the trouble, we are told that Yasin is the heart of the Quran. What makes it the heart of the Quran? It's only by reading alone the Bacha the Quran with Tartil. Beautiful. Allah will give you Sawab. But you will not discover why it is the heart of the Quran. What makes it the heart? So if you see the translation, the meaning, it has a different importance to you. Where do you find Yasin? Probably you know. In the Quran at home you have a marker there. Because we are told, read it again and again, a lot of blessings, and it's usually if somebody is dying, so if you read Yasin Sharif, you know his soul, his ruh, departs in peace, more peacefully. And we do that, we read. When somebody is on the throes of death, we read Yasin Sharif, so we know where to find it. But Muhammad, where will you find Surah Muhammad? In this particular one, at the back of it is a very comprehensive index. Just like a dictionary. You look for M. Muhammad starts with M. There's everything about Muhammad. Sir. Everything that the Quran speaks about our Nabi Karim is in there. Everything on your, on your fingertips. But we are looking for Surah Muhammad. The names of surahs are in italics, a special type of writing. You read that, also under M, Muhammad will tell you chapter 47. 47 is easy to find. You know why? Because every page is numbered. 2, 3, 4, 5, 20, 30, 40, 47. Easy to find because every page is numbered. Once you found chapter 47, Surah 47, then I tell you is ayah number 38. Easy to find. Once you found the Surah, ayah also easy to find. 38. The last segment, the last quarter of the last verse of Surah Muhammad, Allah gives us a dire warning, a terrible warning, an awesome warning. What does he say? He says, وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِ الْقَوْمِ غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُ أَمْثَالًا What is that? So, oh you Muslims, if you turn back from the duties and responsibilities which Allah has imposed upon you for being the khaira ummatin, we believe that we are the khaira ummatin, the best of people. He describes us so. He says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas, that you are the best of people evolved for mankind. Not for yourself, but for mankind. The Arabs, not only for the Arabs, but for mankind. The Malays, not only for the Malays, but for mankind. What makes you the best of people? Because you are Saudis, you are Pakistanis, you are Malaysians, what? He says, no, because you enjoy what is right and you forbid what is wrong. These are your qualifications. But and you believe in Allah. If these are your qualities, then you are the best of people. Not your race, not your language, not your color. You stand for this? Ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna nil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. You are the best of people. But if once you become the best of people, this status, this position Allah puts you in, it also confers upon a certain responsibilities. There is no honor without responsibility. <coughs> Every position of honor carries with it certain responsibilities. Our Imam, he carries a greater responsibility than the Muazzin. You agree? The person who just a sweeper, who dusts the place, he's got his responsibilities. The principal of a school has his responsibilities. The headmaster of a school has his responsibilities. The manager, you are a manager, you have certain responsibilities. You are the ruler in the country, you have your responsibilities. In the house, you have your responsibilities. There is no position of honor without responsibility. You can't get honor, prestige, status, and you have nothing to do. Once you are khaira ummatin, 
best of people, it carries that amount of responsibility. <coughs> so Allah bari ta'ala, in this day and age, He has chosen us. And He's warning us that, O oh Muslims, if you turn back from your duties and responsibilities, which He has imposed upon you, for giving you this high and noble status, He will substitute in your place another people. Yastabdil qawman ghayrat. Another people, a foreign people. Thumma la yakunum thalakum. Then they won't be like you. You don't carry out your responsibilities, out you go. The Imam doesn't do his job, what do you do? Get another Imam. The Muazzin, he doesn't make your fafizah, what do you do? Replace him. Your, your, your bosses, you don't do your job, what does he do to you? Fire him. The manager doesn't do his job, he'll be fired. This is the law. Irrevocable law. It's unchanging law. You don't do your job, out you go. You being the khaira ummatin, you don't do anything. And Allah will keep you there, on the pedestal. Because you are Malay, you are a Pakistani, you are an Arab. Mm -hmm. No, no, nothing, no favoritism with him. He's got no favorites. You don't do your job, get out. I'll put somebody else in your place. You don't do your job, get out. I'll put somebody else in your place. That's his law. And this law is an eternal law, unchanging law. He's doing it all the time. In the religious history of man, in the first instance he chose the Jews, Bani Israel. You know that? He sent prophets after prophets to them. Out of the four heavenly books that we Muslims we say we believe in, we say we believe in the Torah, we believe in the Zabur, we believe in the Injil, and we believe in the Furqan. The Furqan is the Quran. Out of the four books, three of them, 75% of the books are Jewish books. You know that? Books given to Jews. Hazrat Musa a.s. a Jew, he was given the Torah. Hazrat Dawud a.s. a Jew, was given the Zabur. Hazrat Isa a.s. a Jew, he was given the Injil. Jew, Jew, Jew. Out of the four books, three are Jewish books. 75% Jewish books. We say we believe that they were sent by Allah. He chose them. He sent prophets after prophets to them. Some of the names we give our children, we say Musa, Jewish name. Dawud, Jewish name. Ishaq, Jewish name. Yahya, Jewish name. You know that? Jews, Jews, our children, we give over them Jewish names. Why? Because these are the names of the righteous servants of God. We are not ashamed to give these names to our children. But the fact remains that Allah chose them. He sends prophets after prophets to them to do a certain job of work. <coughs> they didn't do it. They didn't fulfill their obligation. So a Jew among the Jews, Hazrat Isa a.s., he is telling his people according to the so-called Injil, the New Testament of the Christians. Hazrat Isa is made to say, and the kingdom of God, this high position, this honor, this status, will be taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. This position that you are holding will be taken away from you and given to somebody else. And who that somebody else will be? A nation that will produce fruits. You don't produce fruits, cut it off. Burn it trees that don't bear fruit, what do you do with the trees? Just an ornament, doing nothing, chop it off. Useless. Occupying valuable space. You too, you do the same, chop it off. Replace you. So Hazrat Isa a.s. told the Jews that you will be displaced by somebody else. And there is another law seems to be at work. That when he displaces one group of people by another, Almost invariably, that people who displaces you, who replaces you, is a nation, is a community that you have been looking down upon. That's Allah's punishment. The one you look down upon the most, He makes them to sit on your head. You're looking down upon the Bantus, then one day Allah will make them to sit on your head. You look down upon the Bushman, the hot and pot, He can make them to sit on your head. The people you are looking down upon, He will make them to sit on your head. Now you feel something. 
He still feels that we were the, 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 the master race, we are less and that. Down in the gutter, you. You serve now. In Syria, Syria, the Muslims, the Sunnis, people like you and me, we are the Sunnis. We say we follow the Sunnah, the example of the Prophet The Sunnis, 80% of the people are Sunnis. They ruled Syria. They were a certain group of people called the Alawites. Alawites. Syrians, but they belong to a different community. They believe that Hazrat Isa is God. Same like the Christians say Jesus is God, they say Hazrat Ali is God. And the Sunnis, they exploited these people, as we exploit the African. They exploited them. They won't, they won't send their sons to the army. That's for these low down people, low caste. The Alawites, let them go and join the army, let them go and join the police force. Our sons, we're going to do business. Our sons, we're going to become clerks and professional. Too. Okay. Who do the dirty job? The Alawites. The Alawites. Who's going to work in your house? Those girls are working in your house? The Alawites. They work in your house. As many looking after your children. Very good relationship. Now you got slaves. Slaves in the days, in the 20th century, you got slaves working for you. They are your slaves. Allah turned the tables. That less than 20% of the people are now ruling 80% of the Syrians. Unimaginable. You can't imagine it. Yes, There is a law at work. Why won't you learn? You don't do the job. You don't want to dirty your hands. No, you don't want to dirty your hands. You don't want to do policing. You don't want to join the army. And this guy must be this low caste. The low caste fellow. All right. So now he's got the army, the weapons, one day coup d'etat, you know, toppling the government, and he's now set in position. The 20% is ever there to subjugate you and keep you down. 80% is keeping 80% down. Mm. <coughs> Allah bari ta'ala in his wisdom, he displaced the Jews. By who? By the Arabs. These Jews were looking down upon the Arabs for 3,000 years. They said, you see, Father Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had two wives, Sarah and Hajra. They say, the Jews, that Sarah was his legitimate wife. He entered into a contract with her. But Hagar, they say Hajra, was a bond woman, a slave woman. She was actually a princess of Egypt. The ruler of Egypt, he presented her to him. But the Jews, because of their hatred, they say she was a bond woman, a slave woman. As such, her children count for nothing. They call the Arabs Hagarines, children of Hagar, Hagarines. And the religion is Hagarism. This is the insulting way they speak about the Arabs, their cousins, and the religion, Hagarism. For 3,000 years, they were looking down. I think there might be some windows open on the top. There is a draft coming directly. So it can't be air conditioned. I think it must be some windows. Is there, is there a floor on the top? Because I can see the draft is coming right on the bed. I don't know how long I will last uh, with this cold. You know, I'm getting colder by the minute. Yeah. It's the warmer here. Yes, there is a world of difference. If you present can come a little closer, it will be much nicer. So they were looking down upon their Arab cousins. Good for nothing. Being For the Jews, the Arabs are good for nothing. Barbarians, illiterates, Ummi people. And Allah bari ta'ala chooses them. And makes them to sit on the heads of the Jews. But now once he puts you on the pedestal, it is not forever. You have to do the work, produce the fruits. You don't produce the fruits, he will substitute in your place another people. That's the law, Allah. Why don't people learn? That's the law. So the Muslims spread out. They went as far as Spain, as far as the Atlantic coast. They went and conquered Spain and they ruled that country for 800 years. Muslims ruled the European nation, Spain, for 800 years. No Christian nation has ever ruled Muslims for that period of time. Do you know that? 
The longest that they ever ruled was in Mozambique, the Portuguese. See, Mozambique is a Muslim territory. Even today, 60% of the people of Mozambique are Muslims. Here, next door to us. This place was an Arab outpost, trading post. And there was a governor there, when the Portuguese came along and conquered them, there was a governor by the name of Musa bin Baik. Musa bin Baik was the governor of that territory. When the Portuguese, with his superior gun power, he came and knocked hells into them and conquered the place. Whose place? Musa bin Baik. They couldn't say Musa bin Baik, so they say Mozambique. That's how the name Mozambique comes about. The Muslims went in the, across the straits, the sea between Africa and Spain, and landed at a place, Jabal. They called that mountain Jabal al Tariq. Tariq was the commander who crossed over from Africa to Spain, and the place where they landed, they called that mount Jabal al Tariq. Now, the Westerners, they call it Gibraltar. Jabal al Tariq, they said Gibraltar. The Muslims went as far as the Philippines. They had the trading post there. Ma'manullah. By the help of Allah, they reached there. Ma'manullah. They said Manila. Muslim, Muslim, Muslim. The longest that the Christians ever ruled Muslims was in Mozambique for 500 years. They ruled your motherland, Indonesia, for 300 years, the Dutch. 300 years. The longest was in Mozambique. 500 years. The Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years. What were they doing? Muslims were having a jolly good time, Allah. As the African is having now, here, the white man, same thing, the Muslim was same position. In Spain for 800 years he had it. The Africana is here only for 300 years. He's having a good time, the halwa and the <laughs> nice, nice things here. Yeah. He's having it only for 300 years. The Muslims had it for 800 years. And they're listening to the dire warnings of the Quran. Allah is warning them. He's warning us all, all times. The warnings are eternal. Before that. They read this. They read in the Salat, during the Quranic, the Rakats. In our Salat, they read. During the Tarawih, they read. And they read the Tilawah in the homes, they read. These are Arabs. They understood what they were reading. It was the language. In our case, we have an, a lame excuse for saying, we don't understand. It's an excuse we have. We don't understand what we read. Allah has given us warning, but this is like water on duck's back because we didn't know what the warnings were about. So now, I want to put you in a dangerous situation. I said, look, get the translation. So you won't have any more excuses. That's why you are afraid. Don't buy. You are in deeper trouble. <laughs> yes. Now you want to read, Salah is telling you this, is hey, man. And if you don't heed the warning, double trouble. You'd rather be in single trouble. Just say, I didn't know. If you think you'll get away with that. The Arab is reading this in his own mother tongue. And Allah is warning him. Kam taraku min jannatin wa ayyun. Say how many were the gardens and the fountains they left behind. Wa zoomim wa makamin kareem. And cornfields and monumental buildings. Wa ni'matin kanu fi ha faqihin. And wealth and the amenities of life in which they took so much delight. Kathalika. That's other people we made to inherit these things. And neither the heavens nor the earth shed a tear for them, nor was respite given to them anymore. They read it. But when they read it, you know what they're thinking about the Egyptians. They are thinking about the Egyptians, the fool, the Pharaoh. 
You know, Allah, look at them. The garden they had and the fountain they had and the monumental building, the pyramids and the sphinx. Oh, what was they had? <coughs> and confused everything they had. The riches, riches. One of the most richest civilized nation at the time of the time was Egypt. And the fool, he didn't hit the warning. Allah sends plague after plague, warnings after warnings. He didn't hear, even till Allah destroyed him in the Red Sea. Drowned him and his hordes and his troops. He drowned him in the Red Sea. <laughs> you see that fool? He didn't learn. He didn't learn. See what Allah did to him? <coughs> the fool doesn't know that he is in the firing line now. While he's reading, he is in the firing line. Because when you read this today, as soon as you read this, you think of Spain. Allah. You know, if you ever go to Spain, if you ever visit that country, you see that the Alhambra, the Cordova, all these beautiful cities that the Muslims left behind, buildings, beautiful buildings, and fountains in disuse. That's the only thing that there is that, that one can see in Spain. Besides the bullfights, if you're interested in bullfights, you know that they can show bullfights. And the women, they, when they do the dancing, they have something on the fingers called castanets. They make kitty, 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 you know, when they... Besides that, there's nothing in Spain, except the buildings that our forefathers left. That's all that there is to see. But for 800 years, Allah gave them a mighty long inning to do the job. No, they won't do the job. You know why? Because proud, arrogant, so these Spanish people, pig eaters, <laughs> what can they understand about Islam? Drunkards, drunkards. What can they understand about Islam? That's, that's the mentality. We have the same. You see, when I'm talking about something, think whether we are in the same, the same sickness we have, the sickness that they have. These this colored people, what can they understand about Islam? Huh? You know the amount of alcoholics in South Africa, their alcoholic rate is five times that as of any other race in the country. <laughs> Can they understand anything about Islam? At the slightest pretext, you know, they're ready to bash you. On one of my trips, I was in Elsie's River. I think Brother Muhammad, he had his supermarket there. And we just got the message that you know, the, elect the power failed. So he wanted some cranking machines to work the tillers. So he said, come on, let's go. So we went. So he was giving the cranking machines, you know, to work the tills because the power was not working. So I'm standing there and looking, and I see an African there, and somehow you found seemed to be quite an intelligent African. So I'm, I'm telling him, I said, you know, these people here, I can't make out the difference whether these people are Muslim or not. There's no indication. So he tells me, he says, you know, sir, I lived here in Elsie's River before they pushed us out to Google it too and what is Langa and whatever. Before they pushed us, we used to live among them. And I can tell you, pass, very easy to find. The difference is how. He said, you see, about three times, these coloreds, they bashed me up for no reason. Drink and they says, bash up kafir, bloody kafir. These Malay people, they're very good people. You know, they don't do that. That's his way of identifying. The colored and the Malay. Otherwise, we look the same. Am I right? Look, in your looks, there's no difference. Wallah, there's no difference. In your surname, there's no difference. In your language, there's no difference. The only thing that indicates that you are a Muslim is when I see the kufya on your head, I say, no, this guy's a Muslim. How the heck can I know? No? Mrs. Johnson visits me. Johnson. I say, are you Muslim? She says, yes. I say, what's your husband? He says, also Johnson. She is a Muslim. I said, yes. So where do you live? Say on Johnson Road. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, there's no... So my husband is a journalist. Johnson, I have to ask again and again, Muslim? Your husband Muslim? No indication. Mr. Hendricks. What's Hendricks? You have a Christian Hendricks or Muslim Hendricks? If I'm wrong, you must correct me. Okay. <laughs> Muslim Brown? <laughs> Our Qari tonight is a Muslim Brown and we have a Christian Brown. Am I right? That means this is what our slave martyrs gave our forefathers. We still carry those names. In looks, when I went to Habibia in my previous trips, Hanif Ali was the principal. 
he tells me, he says, look, he's taking me through the different classes. And he says, look, just watch the features of these children in the different classes. So I'm just scanning and I'm, the children respond. I'm watching the features. Mm -hmm. Next class. Mm -hmm. Next class. Mm -hmm. From pure black to pure white. And there were group areas. If I was an inspector, say, hey, you, you should be in an African school. And you, you should be in a white school. What the hell are you doing here? From pure black to pure white. Among us. Muslims all. Then I go to Stellenbosch. There was a Mr. Gabriel. He was a teacher and we were talking. He takes me to his school, colored school. He didn't tell me anything, but I was doing the same thing. Scanning the children. Wallah, from pure black to pure white. Same, same. That means this, your looks can't give me any indication what you are. It's only if you have a kufia on, I said, no, this guy is a Muslim. Otherwise, no. Otherwise, the other man says the behavior. Can the colors understand anything about Islam? The Bushma in the Kalhari, you think he can understand anything about Islam? The cotton pot, can he? No, backward people, ignorant people, what can they understand? That mentality prevailed in Spain. These pig eaters, the Spanish people, these wine bibbers, the Spanish people, what can they understand? That arrogance. I'm telling, I say, your forefathers could. Where your forefathers, I'm talking to the Arab. Were they worse than the Spanish people? Never. <coughs> your forefathers, the Arabs, of the Ayyamul Jahiliyyah, of the days of ignorance, before Islam, they married their stepmothers. Did the Spanish people do that? No. These Arabs, they were marrying their stepmothers. Father died, he inherited his wife as well. They buried their daughters alive. Did the Spanish people do that? No. You were drunkards, adulterers, gamblers, the worst of human creatures. That Gibbon, the master historian, describes the Arabs before Islam. He says the human brute, almost without sense, is poorly distinguished from the rest of the animal creation. The only thing that makes him different from the animal is the form. This form. Fi ahsani taqwim. Allah has made you in the best of form. Otherwise, animal and worse than animals. You, your forefathers. And Allah could change you through his book. His wahi, his revelation, the Quran. He can't change the Spanish people. No. For 800 years, you could do nothing. Look, the white man has done the job. In 300 years, he has Christianized the nation. This in Africa, South Africa, has the biggest percentage of Christians in the whole of Africa. If Libya boasts highest percentage of Muslims, South Africa boasts the highest percentage of Christians. The white man, he did the job. Among the you carry colored identity, among all those who carry colored identity, the majority of them are Christians. The African majority are Christians. The white majority are Christians. This is an ocean of Christianity. He did the job. We, in 800 years, we couldn't make a scratch. Your pride, your arrogance, you didn't want to share. Allah says, you don't want to do your job? He said, Fata Rabbasu, you wait. And they waited. You know, the fools, they waited. Allah says, wait. <laughs> you say, you're following Allah's command. No, that wait was not waiting. It's a warning. So look out. So they start looking out. Another fool. <laughs> Their language is like that at times. You say something, but you mean something else. Like a Frenchman learning English. He was trying to learn English, mastering English grammar. And he's sitting in a high rice building, skyscraper, <coughs> sitting near the window and is trying to memorize his lessons. And he hears a shout, look out! So he looked out and a big crazy. <laughs> Lucky he didn't die. The guy said, what the hell is this? I am told, look out, so I look out. They said, no, when we English people say, look out, we pass off. <laughs> it doesn't mean look out, pass off. <laughs> you understand, pass off. That's Africa, pass off. Hmm? Means look out. Pass off, means it's a warning. Am I right? It's a warning. See, so that's a warning. Look out means be careful, be on guard. So he looked out, gets it in the head. Allah says, Fatah you wait. <coughs> this is not waiting. It's a warning. Like you bully some little fellow here, and he tells you, Uncle, you wait. 
I'll bring my brother. And his brother, you know, by reputation, is the biggest hooligan in this area. <coughs> in Weinberg, in Weinberg. Yeah, the biggest hooligan in Weinberg is his brother. I'm asking, will you wait? You'll wait for him. He said, look, you wait, uncle. I'll bring my brother and come. And you're going to wait. When you know his brother is the biggest hooligan in this area, biggest bully, you wait. No, no, he's telling you to wait, but you run for dear life. <laughs> because you know what to expect if he comes. So Allah says, Fatarabbas, you wait. Hatta yakti Allah bi amri, until Allah's decision comes about for your destruction. You wait for that. They waited for 800 years. Allah says, you wait, and they waited. Allah is a subu, he is long suffering, patient. 800 years he gave you a chance to come right. And 800 years you didn't do the job. So he says, Yes, tabdil qawman ghayrakum. He will substitute in your place another people. Thumma la yakum wa mthalakum. And they won't be like you. And he displaced them. Finished. Gone. Gone to the dogs. There was not one Muslim left after 800 years to give the azan. We are here for 300 years. Can you imagine after 300 years, wiped out by a man, not one guy left in this country to give the azan. Worse than that. After 800 years, not one fellow left in that country to give the azan. This is the punishment. You don't do your job, say change. Get out of the way. You're rubbish. You don't do your job, you don't deserve to be. Khair ummatin. You come to Baghdad, Samarkand, Bukhara, and the Harun al-Rashid, Mamun al-Rashid, veritable fairy land. They created a veritable fairy land. The type of scenes, the buildings, <coughs> and the gardens and the fountains that existed, you can't reproduce them anymore except on the screen. On screen you can do anything, you know, in the films. In real life, no more. On the borders with the Mongols, barbarians. Will they deliver the message of Islam? No, no, no. <laughs> what can they understand about Islam? Same with the Buddha, what can he understand? The Bushman, what can he understand? The Bantu, what can he understand? That's a mentality. Same. What can they understand about Islam? <laughs> barbarians. Barbarians, you, were you better than they, your forefathers? No. Allah's kalam could change you, but can't change them. Mm -hmm. That's right. Allah says, Fatarabbas, you wait. And they waited. At the very hands of these very people, Allah destroyed them. The same barbarians, they put the Muslims in the dark. Destroyed the Islamic empire utterly. That even today the shocks of that defeat is still not gone out of, out of our blood. The shock of those defeats is not gone out yet. All these problems, problems all that, that started there. The shocks of those defeats. They conquered us and they demoralized us utterly. History tells us, I'm ashamed even to tell you. History tells us that these Mongols, these barbarians, one, one guy, one guy alone, one guy. He can lead a hundred Muslims like sheep and goats. One man alone can say, come on, go. The whole lot of guys, no one. And he'll, like sheep, shepherding them. One guy can do it to a hundred. And it is told to us, history tells us, that the Muslims somehow, you know, collided with one of these Mongols in the street. And the Mongol lost his temper. He said, bend down, I'll chop off your head. So the Muslim bent down. He says, I forgot my sword at home. He says, you wait, I'm coming. <laughs> you wait, I'm coming. And the man went home, he brought his sword. The Muslim is still bent down, he's still waiting. So utterly demoralized. You can't even run away. This, you reach that stage. You didn't do your job. Now comes the punishment. That the man tells you, you bend down and wait till I get my sword to chop off your head and you can't even run away. You sh feel ashamed even to tell people. Say, look, this is what we had come to. Muslim, Muslims. Why? You didn't do your job. Allah says, yes, tabdil qawman ghayrakum. He'll substitute in your place another people. Thumma la yakum wa salakum. And he substituted them. By these very Mongols, the Turks, they, later on they became Muslims. And they started helping the Muslims. But, for in the first instance, destroyed them all. Because you didn't do your job. We Muslims, we ruled India for 1,000 years. 1,000 years we ruled India. Eventually, when partition takes place, 
The Muslim gets one quarter, the Hindu gets three quarter. Why? You didn't do the job. You didn't do the job. And even now you don't want to do the job. Even today, wallah, the only solution to the Muslims of India, my motherland, there are 150 million Muslims, they are a minority. And imagine, a minority of 150 million? Five times the total population of South Africa, men, women and children, Indian, African, colored and whites, all put together, five times that amount of Muslims in India and they are a minority. And they can do nothing. Daily, average of three riots are taking place against the Muslims every day. Nobody will believe you. In my own motherland. Why? You didn't do the job. Today, solution to your problem is deen. Propagate. No, you won't do it. You want excuses. He said, look, we are not perfect ourselves. What an excuse. Look at us. How many of us got beards? It's very few. How many of us make, come for salah five times a day? Very few. You expect today we are a thousand million. You expect everybody to be angels. Everybody to have standard sized beards. Everybody to wear kurtas. Huh? Is it possible? Thousand million. All become five time prayers. You don't sin anymore, you don't drink, don't govern, nothing. Yeah, you are perfect angels, thousand million. You know what will happen? Allah doesn't need that. He doesn't need all angels walking this earth. He's got plenty of angels saying, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. He wants you and me that you fall. You make a mistake and you cry. He loves that. He loves that. Everybody is an angel. Like robots, five times a day we are here. Fasting, we are perfect. Zakat, we are perfect. Everything, we are perfect. That's all right. He says, wipe you out. Finish. Okay. Jannah is there for you. <laughs> he doesn't need you. That type of people who do that, Suri, Subhanallah, Tasbih, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. He's got billions, billions of angels doing that. What is he going to do with you? With you? <laughs> he doesn't need you. Wallah, he doesn't need you. He wants you as you are. Fall down, wake up, cry. Walk again. Fall down, wake up, cry. He loves that. <coughs> Not to say that you must become sinners. You make an effort. That's what he wants. He knows that you are weak. A khulikal insan of if I says he's made man weak. He are weak. He wants, he knows you are weak. He appreciates your shortcomings. He appreciates you falling down and trying to get up. Good enough in his sight. But when will the day come that we are all perfect? Never! Never, Allah, never. You can never be a thousand million angels walking this earth. And you're waiting for that before doing your job. In the meantime, the enemy is going to wait for you. You want to become perfect here before opening your mouth. You won't propagate Islam because you're not perfect. I want to know when will all the Malays be perfect. And the Indian Muslims, you know, the Parkars and what the Paflankar and Bandarkars all become perfect. When? 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 Is it possible? No. Then you'll never start. In the meantime, the Christian is making inroads. He's stealing our children. In so many different ways, we are losing. By marriage, we are losing. You go and marry a colored girl. Nominally, you convert her. Nominally. Make her to read the kalima, shahada. Make her to say, teach her to say, salam alaikum. And then, the marriage breaks up. Where does she go? with your Fatmas and your Khadijas and your Muhammads, where does she go? Back to her aunties and her grannies. Your Muhammads and Fatmas and Khadijas are getting, going to church. You know that? We have lost thousands like that, thousands we have lost. You die, where does she go? Back to her aunties and her grannies. And your Fatmas and Muhammads and Khadijas are getting Christianized. Thousands we have lost. Now, so careless we are. Just bring them in. <laughs> Take her to the shah, make her to read the kalima, shahada. I said, you're going to marry this man? I said, yeah, and nikahum in sunnati, for man rakiba in sunnati, for laysa minni, of kama kaal. I said, right, okay, now you've got the license, go and procreate. My dear children, my young people, I'm very happy tonight I see so many young faces. In the other places I didn't find so many young faces. When you take that step, make sure that this wife that you're going to convert, you can make her a better woman, better Muslimah, than your mother at home, than your sister at home. If you can't do that, don't tempt providence, don't take a chance. 
unless you can make her better than your mother at home, better than your sister at home, which you can't. Which you know. This is just a conversion of convenience. That everybody says, well, she's a Muslim now. What Muslim? Do you pray in the house? No. You think she's going to pray? No. You yourself are not good Muslim. How are you going to make her a good Muslim? Your family is not good Muslim. You know, we know, we know. How are you going to make her a good Muslim? So losses upon losses, losses upon losses. Excuse for not propagating. What do you say? We are not perfect. In India, solution to a problem is to propagate. They won't. They won't propagate. This is the answer to your problem, Allah. And there is a group of people. There are a group of people there whom we consider to be of the lowest rung of the ladder. You just woo them with a little gentleness. Wallah, you can just gather them in. I went to my motherland after 50 years. I left that country in 1927. I returned to that country in 77. After 50 years, I did go. Then I go to one of the villages. And in that village I saw that the natives of the place, they look like us, they haven't got woolly hair, but they do the menial work for us. The native of the place, they are hero worshipping us. We are like gods. Like the Afrikaner is like a god. To us, oh bas, bas. Same thing there, that that Indian, the laborer, he's looking up to us like a god. So I says, man, that's very good. Very good relationship, you know. That means you can just call them. You just call them and they happen to you. They need, they dare not refuse. So I'm telling my host, I said, look, in the village, tell them that all these laborers, I want them to come tomorrow morning with the wives and the children. Come here tomorrow morning. I want to talk to them. By royal command, as if they were all there. Wallah. Next morning, all the men and the women and the children, they are there. Seated on the ground in the dust. I sit on the little stool and I speak to them. Telling them about my origin, my forefathers were also Hindus. Originally, they were every Indian. For 5,000 years we were Hindus. I don't know whether you know. Your great grandfathers were Buddhists. You know the Malaysian, Indonesians, they were Buddhists. <laughs> Nothing to be ashamed of. Nothing. We should be proud that Allah Bari Ta'ala gave them Hidayah. Today we are Muslims. Otherwise we would be still worshipping Buddha and so many other things. So I started explaining how we became Muslim and you know how Islam welcomes them all. I spoke in Urdu because that man didn't understand English, the villager. So I had to speak in my broken Urdu and he translated into that native language, whatever I was saying. Within the hour, they all want to become Muslim. Just me talk them light, light have a chat and they all want to become Muslim. So I'm telling my host, ki inko musulman banao. I said, convert them. So he says, hamare liye kaam kon karega? He said, who's going to work for us? <laughs> <laughs> so if you become Muslim, he can't work. Huh? A Muslim can't plow the leaf field. A Muslim can't sweep the street. A Muslim can't chop the wood. What do you mean? He said, who's going to work for us? That means now you want to keep them there. You can exploit them better. You don't want to make them your brothers. The result? Destruction. Wallah, inviting destruction. The people are there, here. There are people here. Wallah, there are people here. I'm not talking about the missionary who comes and knocks at your door. The missionary who comes and knocks at your door, he's got vested interests. There's livelihood, respect in his community for doing the job. He comes and knocks at your door and he wants to convert you. Huh? He wants to convert you. There's something valuable. Well, if he gets a Muslim, there's something achieved. Like in my part of the world, Natal and the Transvaal, if they get one of my nation, it's a diamond that he's got. The others, the Madrasis, the Tamils, the Telugus, is cheaper by the dozen. It's not the same value, it's like a ton of coal. One diamond is worth more than a ton of coal any day. So it's a pride, he says, I got a Didat follow, I know I got a Lokhat follow, I got a Parak, it means something. There's other, there's others, cheaper by the dozen. So they are out. You are a challenge. 
The Muslim is a challenge. 300 years they tried. They hammered your people for 300 years. They changed your language, they changed your culture, they changed your names. But you retain Islam. You happen to be one of the most militant Muslim communities in the world. You can only compare yourself with the Malays in Singapore and the Malays in Malaysia. They are jellyfishes. Your, your cousins as your, and your fathers, your uncles, they are like jellyfishes compared to you. You are as hard as steel. That hammering has done you good. You didn't like it, but it has done you good. Wallah, it's made militant people out of you. What are we going to do? You were brought here against your will. Your forefathers didn't come here. My forefathers did. They came because they were starving in India. They thought, you know, South Africa easier living than there in India. We were starving, so they came. I came in 1927, and I know what I went through. I didn't have shoes. I had a calico shirt hanging outside and a calico trousers. <coughs> I didn't own a handkerchief. The handkerchief was only the rich people. They used to keep it here for ornament. When you saw a man, that means somebody. He had a handkerchief here. My handkerchief was my coat. In winter, when father bought me a coat, I used this as a handkerchief. When the nose is wetted, it's coming down, drops are falling. <laughs> Wallah. After eating, you wash your face. What do you do? This thing is shiny, this thing is shiny. Shine, they shine. It's all that constant. No, This is all shiny. And nobody in my life ever told me, Ahmad, what's this? Nobody. Because you know, it was, they expected that. So what else can you do? Everybody, every other boy had the same. You know, all this shiny, shiny, shiny. We came because we were starving. You were brought here because the Dutch, when they conquered your country, Indonesia originally, those of your forefathers who were fighting for their freedom, they were captured as prisoners of war and shipped to the Cape of Good Hope and sold to the white men as slaves. When the British conquered Malaysia, those of your forefathers who were fighting for their freedom, they were captured as prisoners of war and shipped to the Cape of Good Hope, Good Hope for the white man, and sold to him as slaves. Under those conditions, you couldn't open your mouth. If you open your mouth, the white bass will break your jaw. You can't even pray. You have to do things in hiding. Now that's your history. We didn't expect, nobody expected anything from you. But Allah had a purpose. You didn't like it. But Allah had a purpose in having you brought here. You didn't like it. Your forefathers didn't like it. Wallah, how can you like it? Separated from your motherland, from your parents, your relations and all into a foreign land, enslaving for the enemy. Who would love a thing like that? But Allah had a purpose. Same like he had with Bibi Hajra and little Ismail. Allah bari ta'ala commands Ibrahim alayhi salam to leave them where Makkah is today. In the desert. With some water and some food. And Hajra ran short of water. And the child is dying, Ismail, infant Ismail is dying of thirst. So she runs between Safa and Marwa. They were small hillocks. So she runs, she walks down and she runs. And she walks up the other hill and she looks around looking for some people, habitation, nothing. And she comes down and she runs and she goes up the other hill and she looks around, nothing. You think she liked it? Allah liked it. Her performance, that love and compassion for her child, Allah loved that. What she was doing for her child. So he made it one of the fundamentals of Hajj. So you too do the same. In emulation of Hajra, do the same. Did Hajra like it? No. Did Ismail like it? No. Allah had a purpose. Now we can see that there was a purpose. Today three million people are gathering there because of that. Allah had a purpose. Allah bringing you all here, for what? To have a jolly good time? Hmm? Dance with the coons? Is that why he brought you here? No. He's brought you here to do a job of work, Wallah. Because you can't get another Malay to come here. You know that? You can't get another Indonesian to come and live with us. You know that? Out! Another Indian, Pakistani can't come here. You know that? You can't! 
They will never allow any black man to come into the country. But you are here. Almost a quarter million now. For what? For nothing? No, Allah had a purpose. Wallah, in his master plan, there is a purpose. And an opportunity that Allah is giving you and me. That you and I can turn the tables. We can change the situation in this country. We can, with a little exertion. If you do a little bit of homework. Unfortunately, we don't really do homework. The Muslim doesn't want to do anything. Even for himself, he wants to do nothing. He's satisfied. Bacha the Quran, mashallah. Sawab, sawab, sawab. We listen to our qaris, mashallah. All this we are prepared to do. But we don't do a little bit of homework to find out what is Allah telling us? What is He commanding us? Nobody wants to know. Because we don't know Arabic. What about a translation? Get an English translation. Get an Afrikaans translation. And what better than this? Today, you can get this book, 2,000 pages. Wallah. Actually, 1,920. Where does it hurt to make it 2,000? 2,000 pages for five rands. There is not another book on earth, wallah. On earth, you can buy 2,000 pages, hardcover book for five rands. You just buy the Arabic Quran. I don't know how much it costs you for your children. Anybody know? The Arabic Quran, you know, for your children that read in, in the house without the translation. How much? And that's only about 300 pages. You know that? This is 2,000 pages for five rands. It's unimaginable. Allah, you can't imagine it. This is like stolen property. I'm giving it to you. Liquidation stock. You know, there's a liquidation stock. Somebody has gone bankrupt. I'm giving it to you. Five rands. I says, look, you owe it to yourself. Improve your English, this book will do it. Your English. You don't have to read Shakespeare or Milton even to improve your English. Believe me. We have just made a program, you'll see it inshallah very shortly, on Mnet, open time. Half a minute. You know what's half a minute? 30 seconds. You can 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, to 30, 30 seconds. That 30 second program cost me 27,000 rands. I'm lying to you. Why should I lie to you? I don't know. I'm not asking you for anything. That half a minute program for the Mnet cost me 27,000 rands. And five days a week, we're going to start. It'll cost me 30,000 rands a week. That 30 second program cost me 27,000 rands. I'm lying to you. Why should I lie to you? I don't know. I'm not asking you for anything. That half a minute program for the Mnet cost me 27,000 rands. And five days a week, we're going to start. It'll cost me 30,000 rands a week. Today, for 30,000 rands for half a minute, <laughs> where am I going to get that type of money from? No, you have to have other sources. This 100,000 I'm printing cost me 2 million rand. And I'll sell it for 5 rands each. Madness, foolishness. I said, no, no, don't worry. There is a type of man who's prepared to help me with that. <coughs> you see? So I want to help you. I don't want to pocket the money. I don't want to live on this. I want to spend. I want to, because the more I'm spending, the more I'm getting. <laughs> now I've reached a stage, the more I spend, the more I get. I don't have to say. I said, look, take it, man, five runs. I said, English. So this man, who's, we'll, you'll see him, he's not a Muslim. He's a young man with a beard. So these people who do this production, they brought the man to introduce him to me. He said, this man here, we will use him and his voice for the Edward. So, right. so what are you doing? Ah, he says, he is a professor at the university and professor of poetry. I didn't know that the special professors of different departments is of poetry. I said, you know, English. I said, this book here, this book here, I said, I'm telling my people that you do not have to read Shakespeare or Milton even to improve your English. As a book of literature, English literature, this is a masterpiece. Just forget for the time being, it's the Quran, Allah's Kalam, you have the Arabic text, you have the translation, you have the commentary, you have 2,000 pages, you have an index, everything on your fingertips, forget all that. But just English. So saying, I said, you know, I'm quoting this man here, Yusuf Ali, he's speaking about God Almighty, the ayah of the Quran, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِكُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ فَأَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّ فَسَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ 
He says, to Allah belongs the East and the West, and whichsoever way he turn is the presence of Allah. So in his commentary, he quotes Wordsworth, William Wordsworth, an English poet, who says, a paraphrase of this, as if he had been reading this, he said, whose dwelling, Allah's dwelling, where he stays, not literally, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean and the living air, and in the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. He is describing Allah. Where, where? فَإِنَمَا تَوَلُّوا فَسَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ And wheresoever, where you turn is the presence of Allah. Wherever you look, where sir, Allah is present everywhere. He says 100% mark for that. All this, language, English, subject-wise, what do you want to know? Whatever you want to know, Allah, what do you want to know? You want to know about the Quran, what does the Quran say about the Quran? Open queue. Everything the Quran says about the Quran. You want to know about our Nabi and the Imam said Muhammad. Everything about Muhammad, what the book says about Muhammad. You want to know about Moses, Musa and the Imam, Moses. Everything that the book says about Musa You want to know about Ibrahim and the A, Abraham. You find everything about Abraham in the Quran. You want to know about marriage, everything about marriage in the Quran. Divorce, everything about divorce in the Quran. What do you want to know? Everything on your fingertips. And how much? Five pounds. I just heard that you have a good custom that when your daughters get married, you do give them a Quran as a wedding gift or something <coughs> on parting. I said, right. Now for that, you will have one with gold. Gold, gold. See, this is the ordinary. Inside saying that gold doesn't make any difference with the inside. Page for pages are saying. Only outside is gold. So when you give your daughters, give them in gold. Of course, it will cost you 15 rands. 15 rands. Still, it's below my cost. It will cost me 25 rands to put the gold all together. With the book, 25 rands, you get for 15 rands. Still, you're getting 10 rands back for nothing. This one here cost me 20 rands. I said, look, you can have it for five. What better present can you give? Wedding present? Christmas present? Birthday present? Any excuse, man. Give it to your employer, give it to your employee. Somebody working for you, give it to him. Your employer, give it to him. You have done your duty. On the day of judgment, they say, Ya Bari Tala, you know, I couldn't talk, I was afraid. I gave you a book, you must do the talking now. This is, you are the best advocate that there is. I just led the horse to the river, make him drink, that's your job. You make him drink now. And one little suggestion, that if you want to give this Quran, five rands, wallah, is so cheap. What you do, don't just give it away like that. Tell him, say, look, this book is an encyclopedia, it is, of 2,000 pages. I do not expect you to wade through it. We are all involved in a rat race, you know, we are so busy. You got time to go through a book like this, 2,000 pages? No. So I said, what you do, you just have a look at the index at the back. Anything, just browse through the index. What do you want to know? You want to know about man, the creation of man. You want to know about God. The overwhelming theme of this book is God. What do you want to know? You want to know about your Jesus. So I say, look at the J, Jesus. What does it say? Jesus. First item, and the J, Jesus, a righteous prophet. He's a true prophet of God. Chapter 6, verse 85. His birth is described in two places. Chapter 3, verses 45 onwards. Chapter 19, verses 23 onwards. Let's have a look. Open. Read it to him. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ So behold, the angel said, O Mary, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اسْتَفَاكِ وَتَحَرَكِ وَاسْتَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ That God Almighty has chosen you, purified you, chosen you above the women of all nations. Read the Quran to him. Bacha the Quran. You don't know the impact that it has on the non-Muslim. The Allah's kalam, it has a power, it has moved people to ecstasy and tears. I have seen it happen to non-Muslims. When they hear the Quran chanted beautifully, the non-Muslims, they shiver in the shake. Read it to them. And give the translation before parting with the book. He said, look, anything you want to know, you just open the index and you find it. Everything about Jesus is there. And any questions, you come back to me and I'll be able to help you if I can. If not, I'll take you to my shaykh, my imam. So this is the suggestion, my dear brothers. I don't know whether the sisters are on the top, I don't know. 
But this is it. Acquaint yourself with Allah's kalam. And once you allow Allah Badi Ta'ala to talk to you, because when you read it with understanding, He's talking to you. He's telling you and what He's expecting from you. Inshallah, you can never remain the same. You can't remain the same allowing Allah to talk to you. But when you realize that He's talking to you, He's instructing you, you can't remain the same. You can't sit on your backside doing nothing. As it is, we are all sitting on our backsides doing nothing. You know that? If we understood the book, the Arab, supposed to be understanding the book. Supposed to be. No. He is reading the book, the Arab. I was thinking that the Arab now, you see, if my people, I'm thinking, could understand the book, will be all angels, wallah. All angels walking this earth. So I expect the same thing from the Arab. So when I meet them, I says, no, there's something gone wrong. They understand the Quran. But you know how they're understanding it? Allah is telling, describing it in the Quran. وَإِذَا تُطْلَى عَلَيْهِ آيَاتُنَا قَالَ أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ See, when our signs are rehearsed to them, they say these are tales of the ancients. These are fairy tales, folklore of old times. You know, what Allah Dawood of Jaluta, and Dawood killed Jalut, and Allah made the Bani Israel into monkeys. <laughs> this is for entertainment. They are not thinking that, look, Allah is now talking to them, that they are the monkeys today. They are making monkeys out of us. You don't have to have tail to become a monkey. We say, he's made a monkey out of him. What? He's still handsome and young, good looking. No, we say, he's made a monkey out of him. He's made a fool out of him. So, this is, we are becoming monkeys today. We are the Jalu today. A thousand million and we can't even cry. You know that? A thousand million Muslims and you can't even cry. Say, look, what are you doing to our children in Palestine? You know that? You can't even cry. What is this? The same, the, what the Mongols did to us, same. See, we won't bend down and wait for the Jew to come and chop off our head. But what is this? You tell me. That you can't even cry. You can't even say, what are you doing to my brothers? Can you? No. A thousand million, nowhere in the world does a Muslim is able to cry and shout and say, what the hell are you doing to my people? Nothing. You know why? We have drifted away from the spirit of the Quran. Go back to the Quran. It will charge you. It'll electrify you. You'll be a changed person. Wallah. Then life is cheap. Life becomes cheap. At the moment, you have divisions. We have divisions. You know why? Because we got our own heroes. Everybody's got his own hero. I don't know what my hero says. I said, this is... Muhammad is your hero. And Allah's kalam is your book of direction. Once we have this as a common denominator between us, as soon as there is a dispute argument, he says, Akhi, look, <laughs> let's open to Allah's kalam. Let's see what Allah says. Okay? You can't disagree, sir. Let's see what Allah says. Look, this is what Allah says. Immediately. There's a common denominator. Wallah, there'll be peace and harmony. So, with these words, my dear brethren, I don't know, I have taken so much of your time. Uh, if there are any questions on what I have said, if I made any mistakes you think that I shouldn't have said, it is a good opportunity for you to rectify me. Says, Uncle, look, we don't agree with you. Our forefathers were not brought here. You know, we fell from heaven. We came in a flying saucer. Okay, now whatever you want to tell me, I'm prepared to listen to you. How you came here. No. I may be wrong. So any questions regarding how to deal with the enemy? The Nasara, so the guy comes along and... Here. Uh, we have got some something for you, some little homework to do. Very easy, pleasant. Uh, can I have one of those strips, those cartoons? Somebody who's brought it. <coughs> now we have got some beautiful comic strips. You know, we like our children love comics. There have been people complaining to me that our children, you know, they don't want to read the Quran. I said, "Have you got the Quran at home?" No. <laughs> Yeah, they don't, said, no, they don't want to read the Quran. I said, have you got one at home? He says, no. I said, what do you mean? Look, make it available, number one. Number two, make it a habit around the family. So look, once a week, don't be over, over, over enthusiastic. Once a week, ah, yeah. once a week, Bad al Maghrib, after dinner, get the family around the table, and your young brother or your sister, he said, look, read it and explain to Ma. Read it and explain to Ma. You know what you're doing? You're making it to go through the child's mind actively. The child reads the Arabic of the Quran, then reads the translation and reads the commentary. 
the knowledge, the knowledge of the whole family. And the whole family gets united around Allah's kalam. A better bond. There's no better bond than Allah's kalam to bring us together. All this we can achieve and a reading material. So, now this one here, you see they say the children love comics. They love comics. They do. You see, I started all my English education with comics. When I came from India, comics, comics, comics. I was a comic king. <laughs> well, it was a way of reading. Reading, I don't know. It created a hunger for reading. From comics, I went on to a little promotion into something else and something else, into true love and romance and true detectives and shh, and on and on until I, <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I, I got on to this, you see, what I'm doing now. But now, comics. An open challenge to you, to all. Do you dare to test the faith of any Christian? Do you? There's a question asked to you. Do you dare to test the faith of any Christian? Do you? Have you got the guts? Look, he tells you the story about a Christian fellow coming and knocking at a Muslim's door. And how the Muslim, Ahmad, this is the guy here, supposed to be me, <laughs> Ahmad, and with a Christian missionary called John, I know whom I had in mind. However, you read the comics, entertaining, entertaining. But it ends with, he said, look, what this man Ahmad did to the Christian, just by posing a simple problem. He said, look, you want to share your faith with me? I said, yes. That's what the Christian wants to do. He wants to save you from hell. He thinks you will go to hell. He wants to save you. He loves you so much. So I said, look, you want to share your faith with me? He said, yes. Then I said, now, you, can you, you can't share anything you haven't got. You can only share what you have. I, I'm a beggar. I haven't got a cent in my pocket. I want to share with you 100 rands. Where can I share with you? I haven't got a bean in my pocket. So you can only share what you have. Knowledge, if you have, you can share. Faith, if you have, you can share. Anything, if you have, you can share. What you haven't got, you can't share. So you want to share your faith? I said, yes. <clears throat> have you got faith? He said, of course. I said, look, the book says, your book, in the Gospel of St. Mark, Chapter 16, it says here, And these signs shall follow them that believe. If you got faith, you believe. Now these are the signs that you are able to show. That you are a man, you are a really qualified man. Black belt. How do I know? I must see some signs about you. But it indicate that you must be a black belt expert, you see. So it says, these, those that believe. In my name, in the name of Jesus. They shall cast out devils. Anybody got devil inside? They say, in the name of Jesus, get out. And they will be able to heal. They shall speak with new tongues, which they can't at all. You know, 2,000 years, the guy can't speak my language. I can speak his language. I can speak a dozen different languages without the Holy Ghost. And that with the help of the Holy Ghost, he can't speak even my language. Huh? He can't speak the language of Jesus even. But it says here that they shall speak with new tongues, new, new languages they can speak. They shall take up serpents, snakes, slander. Snakes. And if they drink any deadly thing, poison, it shall not hurt them. These are good Christians. You give them poison, they can drink it, nothing will happen to them. That's what Jesus says. They shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Right. That's all. You memorize that. You just memorize that. Mark chapter 16 verses 17 and 18 that's all memorize that so when the guy comes along he says now you got faith he says yes he says now look you know your good book says that those who believe they can take up serpents and if they bite you nothing happens we've got no time to look for serpents but it can continues you shall speak many tongues can you speak my language Malay he can't but no man we excuse you for that now he says they shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it won't hurt them. If you got faith, you got faith. He said, yes. He said, right. You got some insecticide for killing cockroaches? <laughs> Take it out. He said, look, drink this, man. Huh? Or lemon, we'll put some rose water inside. You know, make it palatable. Huh? Come on. What do you like? What? Choose, choose. Ant killer? What? Cockroach killer? What? What do you want? Because caustic soda, you know, is hard to get. Because you don't make soaps anymore. Hmm? So something that, I'm sure you have something available in the house. Even something innocent. He said, look, this is, uh, this is what acid? This is this, uh, you know, you put in the batteries. He said, look, uh, sulfuric, yeah, sulfuric acid. It's water, water. But he said, look, this is sulfuric acid. Come, drink it. 
<laughs> and you see he runs for dear life. You know, even the water will chase him away. And the guy will never darken your door again. So this is a comic, but you must do that little bit of homework. Once you do the homework, man, a hundred different ways, this thing will come in handy. hundred different ways. It's an amazing thing with knowledge, with any instrument, any tool. Once you know, hammer. You know what's a hammer? Right. What, what you can do? You can knock a hail, nail into the wood. Yeah. What else? You can break a brick with it. Yes. What else? You can smash somebody's head. Yes. What else? A hundred different things you can do with a hammer. Once you're used to handling a hammer, you know a hundred different things you can do with it. So similar. This is a weapon, a tool. You master it. Any excuse you can bring it in. Any excuse. The guy talks too much. He says, hey, you got faith? So yes. You believe in Jesus? Yes. Really? So yes. I said, look, now Jesus says that, you know, if you take up serpents and, you know, nothing can, they can't harm you. They can't find any here. I said, no, it continues, you see, and any deadly things. So look, we've got something around here, sulfuric acid. Would you like to try? So you're mad. I said, no, 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 this is your book. <laughs> so with this, these are available. Pick them up from uh, Rossmith supermarket. We were supposed to have them here to give them to each one of you, one each. Unfortunately, uh, we forgot. So any questions, my dear brother? They'll be available tomorrow afternoon at They'll be available tomorrow afternoon at Grassy Park, and there on we'll have them available all, always. But in case you miss it out, you can pick it up from Rossmead Supermarket. And there's no condition. You don't have to buy anything to get these free books of mine. <laughs> if he makes a condition, you let me know. I'll fly down. I'll fix him right. <laughs> any questions, my dear brothers? Any questions? <coughs> Mustn't be shy. What the Christian or the Jew or the Hindu or the atheist is creating problems for you, I am a specialist in that. You see, if you want to know about the fatwa, about this, that, 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 I say, go and see your sheikh. You must see your sheikh. Please, don't embarrass me. But anything to do with the enemy, I think I'm an expert. If I don't know, I'll make it my duty to find, get the answers for future. <coughs> No questions. Everybody converted? <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I will now ask a Kali to read the dua.